All right, so what we're going to cover real fast today is how to run a one sample Z test using Excel. So we've talked about Z scores, and it's easy enough to get a Z score using that standardized function. A Z test is basically a Z score, but it's for a sample instead of an individual. So as we talked about in class, that means you have to use the standard error. Now that means you can still get a Z score using the standardized function as long as you put the standard error in for the standard deviation. So if I were to do standardize and I put the score of X, which would now be a sample average instead of a single score, I put the expected population value for the mean. And if I put here, instead of the standard deviation, the standard error, which would be the population expected standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, N, as long as I've done that, this standardized function will get you an appropriate Z-score. And you can use that to then get a p-value. So we'll look at that as an option. And you can use that calculator I built to use that function. But Excel also has a function called z-test. And z-test naturally uses uh, that standard error when you put in sigma. So here, if you put in the standard deviation, it will compute the value correctly from those uh, because it'll know the sample size based on the array of data you select. So here, we'll take a look at how we do this quickly. OK, uh, it's always good because when you remember when you're doing a test here, you're asking whether the mean of your sample is different from the population expected value. So here we've got a set of test scores. We've got 30 scores. Um, and what we want to know is, are these test scores different from the expected value based on the professor's past? So the average for the population mu, right, is 70. And the population standard deviation from the past is 10. So here the first thing we're going to do is find out, well, what is the average for this set of data? So we'll use the average command that we've seen before. And we'll put in our set of data, which are located in column A, rows 2 to rows 31. Once we've done that, you see here that the average this term is a little over 73. So we're a little higher. So now the question, is that significantly different? So when you use the z-test function, what it actually spits out is not a z-value, but a p-value. Another thing that is important to realize is it always spits out the p-value for the area right. Okay, So here, this is larger than the mean. So that means that there will not be much to the right of this. So the probability of scoring greater than this value is what we're going to get here. So if we use this z-test function, and our data again are in A2 to A31, the expected value is located right here in D1, and the standard deviation for the population located here in D2. Once we put that in, what we're going to get is the, the p-value for what is the probability of scoring greater than 73. That is, what's the probability we would have a sample of 30 scores with a mean greater than 73.23. And here is our answer. So it's important to note that this is a one-tailed p-value. It is only the area right. So if you're asked to do a two-tailed test, that is not a two-tailed value. Okay. Now we can get from that what is the actual z-score by using a norm function, norm.s.invert, which we've seen before. And here we put in our p-value. Now, if you put in the, the p-value of 0 0.03, it's going to give you a negative z-score because it's working kind of from the opposite way. So it's saying what, what z-score occurs at you know, the third percentile. And that z-score is going to be a small negative value. So if I just put in this value here in G2, what you're going to see is a negative z-score. But if we use the z-score equation, remember the z-score equation says that a z-score is the observed minus the predicted divided by the standard error. So here, our observed value is our sample mean. Our predicted value is the population. And our standard error would be 10 divided by the square root of our sample size, 30. And so here we see that this is the right number, but this is the wrong sign. And the reason is because we're actually above average. 
So this should not be a negative, but a positive value. Okay. So if you ever have these p-values that are low, you can solve that by doing 1 minus that p-value, and that'll get you, because remember, the z is symmetrical. So by doing 1 minus that value, it gets you the positive score. Okay? Okay. So if your p-value here is less than 0.5, right, you're in this tail here, you can just double this to understand, well, what would the two-tailed p-value be, right? So here, if we wanted the two-tailed p-value, what we can do is simply take our one-tailed value and multiply it by two. And so the two-tailed probability of this score is 0 0.077. So a two-tailed test here, we would conclude that this is not significant. We normally use 0 0.05, but if we were to do a one-tailed test, we would call this a significant result. Okay, so we talk more about the hypothesis test in coming chapters. But so here you see that this is a way that you could perform this test. Now, if you'd rather, of course, you can just calculate this out pretty simply using the formula and letting Excel do the math for you, right? And then you could use the norm functions to get your p-value with it. But that z-test option is a way to just get the p-value, one-tailed p-value, straight away. Now notice, if, if we had had a case where we would have a negative z, so let's just see what that looks like real fast. So say that we expected 75. So now we're below average, right? So our z-score is going to be negative because we're below the mean. Now if we get the p-value, okay, this p-value is going to have to be greater than 0.5 because the area right of a score that's below the mean is going to have more than 50% of the scores. So let's try it out and let's see what we would do to solve a case like this. So if we have A2 to A31 and we expect the score in D1 with the standard deviation in D2. So now, this, now notice, this is an enormous p-value. This is not getting us the tail, right? This is getting us the body. How do we know it's the body? Well, it's bigger than 0.5. And we realize that this is because our score is below the mean, so the area right of our score is most of the scores. Okay? So the thing about this is this is not going to be the p-value you actually want. You want the tail, right? It just so happens now that your tail's on the other side. So the way to get that, then, if you get that p-value that's bigger than 0.5, is to subtract that from 1, because 1 is the entire area under the curve. So our actual value that we want here is this one. The probability of scoring lower than 73.23 with an expected value of 75 for a sample average, right, is 0.16. And then we can get two-tailed value by doubling this, right? And we can get our z value by inverting the score. Okay, so we should use the one in G3 here because that will give us the negative. Okay, so when we invert this score, we get that appropriately negative z-score, right? And so that's the only kind of weird thing about using the z-test function is, is you have to keep yourself kind of apprised of which side we're on, right? And so that's why it's always good to know your sample mean. And of course, if all else fails, if you're trying to learn how to use these things, you can go back to just kind of using Excel as that advanced calculator. So again, our observed value would be the sample average, expected value, divided by our standard deviation, divided by the square root of our sample size, which is our standard error. And so here we see that this negative is the appropriate value we should be getting, right? So this is how you can use Excel to do these calculations. Now, the last way that I'll remind you you can do this is to use the standardized function to spit out a z-score. But just remember now that you're doing a z-test. So in a z-test, you've got to remember you need your sample size. So we need to know the size of our sample, which is n, right? And so here we can get our sample size by using the count function. And we can count the values in A2 to A31. And we see that our sample size here is 30. Okay, so here are all the values we need. 
And so we could use this and do our standardized function. So if we do our standardized function, we first want our sample average. We second want our expected value. And then we want the standard deviation. But this needs to be the standard error because the standard error is the standard deviation for the sampling distribution. So for this term, we need to put in the entire expression that is sigma divided by the square root of n. Okay? And when we do this, look at this. There is that z-score. So you can just use that standardized function, and then, of course, you could use that norm .s .dist, put in your z-score, and true, and this gets you the area, right, the cumulative area. So this it tells you this score is at the 17th percentile, right? And so there you get your z and your p. This is a one-tailed p, okay? that way. So there's a couple ways you can do this in Excel, okay? And really, if you'd rather do these by hand, the math here is not that hard. You could do them by hand, or you could just like plug the equation into Excel. Um, probably the most useful thing here for Excel is to use it to get the p-values. Of course, you can also use the table in the back of your book, or you can use that graph pad calculator online that we've seen, and of course, the Excel calculator that I built is another option. So hopefully that helps understand how you can do some of these one sample z tests using Excel.